we're all looking for something, and a lot of us use religion to try and find it, to have something in our lives that can help us make sense of the world and our place in it, something to help us see beyond the darkness and get a glimpse of something more. We all try and satisfy it in different ways, but deep inside all of us, there's a yearning to find the way. Almost invariably, whenever Jesus is addressed within the pages of the Gospels, whether it is from a friend, foe, or stranger, he is addressed as rabbi, an Aramaic and Hebrew term for teacher. And every rabbi, every teacher had to have disciples. So to those who followed him, that's who Jesus was, first and foremost, a rabbi. The Gospels contain these really strange accounts of Jesus' first encounters with his disciples. For a while, I couldn't figure them out. There are a few of them, but they all roughly go like this. Jesus approaches people who are just going about their lives, doing their jobs, and he'll give them two simple words, follow me. And instantly, they literally drop everything and just follow him. It's kind of strange and maybe comes across as a bit inauthentic. I mean, why would anyone leave their livelihood behind in an instant to follow this guy. In Jesus' time and place, it would have been very unusual for a rabbi to seek out his own disciples. You see, in a culture where church and state were fused, in which religious and civic life were one, the greatest thing a young man could aspire to become was a rabbi. And you could only do that by seeking out a rabbi to be his disciple. Unlike today, rabbis in Jesus' time would also have a separate trade. They would usually work a regular job by day and then teach in the evenings. So rather than simply being its own job, the title of rabbi was something any man would aspire to attain. In fact, most young men memorized huge portions of the Torah by the age of 13 then only the best and the brightest would move on to become disciples of a rabbi. It was an extremely difficult process, and those who couldn't cut it would have to settle for a life of working an everyday job and nothing more. So when we look at Jesus' disciples, these would have been young men who would not have made the cut, who were not the best and brightest of their peers. Instead, they had to move on with their lives and take on other jobs. With that in mind, it makes sense that these rejected young men would so immediately respond to this unbelievable second chance of a rabbi actually seeking them out and inviting them to follow him. Even more, Jesus called all of his disciples in Galilee, an extremely culturally and ethnically diverse place. This group he was forming was composed of people of many different, even opposing, political beliefs, backgrounds, and social standings. One that would lead anyone to question how they could all possibly coexist. New York is one of the most ethnically and culturally diverse cities in the world. Pretty much every major religion is well represented here. 
And no matter their beliefs and practices, any religious teacher's job is to guide people to some sort of a way, a way of thinking, a way of living, a way of being. So to explore that role further, I spoke with a teacher and a leader from a religion I was less familiar with. This is the Jamaica Muslim Center in Queens, New York. It's the largest Islamic center in the city. I sat down to speak with their imam and director, Shamsi Ali. And I guess you could call it the prayer room. Normally we call it musalla. Musalla means the place where people are praying. It's used for services as well as individual prayer, so it's always busy. The room is constantly uh, filled with humans. We covered a lot of topics, but we started with the basic tenets of his religion, such as the five pillars of Islam. Number one is to certify that there is no God worthy to be worshipped but God and believe in Muhammad. And also uh, praying five times daily, fasting in Ramadan, giving charity. And the last one is pilgrimage to Mecca. Basically, we discussed the Quran. The prime source of Islam. If you want to know Islam, then you have to know the Quran. He detailed the two main denominations of Islam. But in Islam, there are two big sects, Sunni and Shia. And as we transition to what his religion means to him personally, he talked about it serving as a guide. You know, for me, Islam means a guidance to live my life um, in dignity and uh, in, in, in respect. And I meant respect here uh, in my relation with God and my relation with other people around me. Islam guides us how to live our life um, uh, in terms of connecting ourselves to God. For Imam Ali, Islam is a guide. It highlights the way. But when he first immigrated to this country by moving to New York, he suddenly found himself in an environment of many different people with many different ways of life and belief systems. The moment I landed here in this country, it opens my mind that I'm not living in one single community anymore. And I consider American as my community, be it Muslims, Jews or Christians. So from that moment, I built interfaith dialogue. And so I'm well known as an imam who is an interfaith imam. You know, so I'm leading a Muslims here, but I'm, you can find me in the churches, in the synagogues, and different places. So he sought ways to build bridges with people of different religions. And one commonality Islam has with Judaism and Christianity is their prophets, a title that in Islam includes more than just the prophet Muhammad. In fact, in Islam, uh, there are five mighty prophets, the most important prophets. Number one is um, uh, Abraham, Noah, and then Moses. And certainly this is the point of difference between us and Christians. Uh, Jesus is one of the mighty prophets in our teaching. And the last one is Prophet Muhammad. So, and interestingly, Imam Ali highlights that in Islam, these prophets actually play the role of teacher. That we consider as our teachers, as our guide in our life. Even more, all of these teachers are equally important. I, I cannot be a Muslim unless I do believe in Jesus or Moses or other prophets of God, equally to Muhammad. And when I asked him about Jesus' role specifically in Islam, he painted a picture I wasn't really expecting, one of Jesus as their moral compass. Jesus in Islam, is very important. Um, uh, he's our role model, of course. And as an imam who has dedicated himself to building bridges, he sees this as a key component of Jesus the teacher, someone who provided a way for people no one else was interested in. And I have to admit that I was surprised to hear this Muslim imam say that Jesus and his teachings are what we need most in our time today. A uh, time where uh, compassion should be there, love should be there, uh, it's about caring for others, it's about caring for the, the weak and the marginalized. I think uh, we are living in a time where the richer are becoming even more richer and the poor are becoming more manipulated. Um, uh, we see that, uh, this phenomenon. If Jesus is living today, he will fight for the right of those who are marginalized. So I think Jesus is, is a role model for us and we need him even more. In the time where people are losing compassion, losing their, losing their heart and human sense, those on the fringes, whose society has abandoned. Those who just need to find a way. That's who Jesus reached out to. Towards the beginning of Luke's Gospel, Jesus goes back to his hometown of Nazareth 
and announces the beginning of his revolution. But he does it in a very rabbinical way. He goes to the synagogue, stands up, and reads from the scroll of Isaiah, describing a mission to reach out to the weak and the marginalized. Then he does something totally unexpected. He claims that this scripture has just been fulfilled in their hearing. This is the Shrine of the Book, located in the Israel Museum. It's essentially a temple to scripture. This scroll is a scroll of Isaiah, the same book that Jesus would have read from in the synagogue. To announce his revolution, Jesus the rabbi didn't use his own words, but these words. To emphasize that he was given a timeless message, one given by prophets before him, but it had been forgotten. They had lost it. When Jesus did use his own words, it was to say that his mission was not just to bring that message back, but to fulfill it. In saying that, Jesus the rabbi made a revolutionary claim that scripture was more than just words, that one day those words would become real. That time was now. To see the message come to life Look at him. A religious teacher's job is to guide people to the way. A way of thinking, a way of living, sacred scriptures. But for the gospel writers, Jesus was a very different kind of teacher. He was the ultimate rabbi. He was the way itself. I think what's so dissatisfying to people about some of the modern teachers of Christianity is that that's basically all they do, teach. Growing up, we had a local pastor who taught every week at church and at school, and later on we found out he had been stealing donation money the entire time. What's the point of teaching a message if you're not living it? I think that's what's so appealing about the Jesus of the Gospels. He didn't just teach a revolutionary message, he lived it out in his life as well. When Matthew begins laying out Jesus' revolutionary manifesto, the Sermon on the Mount, he highlights an interesting detail. Jesus sits down and gathers his disciples around him. This is exactly what a rabbi would do. He goes on to give many beautiful, sometimes difficult teachings. But perhaps the most difficult of all of them is to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. For us, this phrase is a cliché, a trite Christian expression. But can you imagine the people hearing that for the first time? Keep in mind, we have no historical record of anyone saying this before Jesus. How could you possibly love your enemy, and why would you even want to? What Matthew highlights next is simply amazing. As these questions are still ringing in his disciples' heads, Jesus descends from the mountain, and one of the first things that happens is he encounters a Roman centurion the literal embodiment of Jewish oppression. He was the enemy. He and his kind were responsible for thousands upon thousands of Jewish deaths. This centurion then asked Jesus to heal his servant, whom he loved. Just try to imagine that. That would be like a Nazi approaching Jewish doctor asking him to heal one of his own. How could you possibly grant that request? To everyone's shock and amazement, this Jewish rabbi immediately heals the centurion's servant. Jesus was a rabbi who did not just teach, he lived what he taught. And his disciples were witnesses to all of it. This is how they began to understand the meaning of his teachings. There's a famous Ben Franklin quote that says, Tell me, and I forget. Teach me, and I may remember. Involve me, and I learn. That's exactly what Jesus did. He wasn't just a sitting rabbi, he was a walking rabbi. He taught by example.
Back when I spoke with Coach RJ and Coach Amir of the City Basketball, we talked a lot about the learning process, particularly as coaches, the importance of involving your players. You see, in basketball, you're not asked to memorize huge amounts of material, you're not lectured to, you're involved, you're engaged physically. And according to Coach RJ, kids learn better that way. Kids learn when, they're, when, they're, when their body, they learn better, and I, this is what I think, when their bodies are moving, when they're like, they, they, can, they can really, they, they can soak up a lot more information. When they're sitting behind their desk, their, their attention span kind of fades a little bit. It's tough to sit there for numerous hours. Because they're engaged when it, you're moving. Exactly. And I asked them if they could sum up what the fundamental difference was between learning in the classroom and learning on the court. So yeah. one thing that, that we've always pride, pride ourselves on, we don't teach our guys how to run plays. We teach them how to play. And that may not seem like a huge distinction, but it has all the difference in the world. They're not just looking to fill these kids' heads with a bunch of rules or abstract knowledge. They're providing experiences that will fundamentally change their mindset. Teaching a kid to think in ways that will prepare them for anything basketball or even life throws their way. It's a lot of read and react. Sometimes you gotta see what your defender's gonna do, and then you counter, you counter that with a move. And in life, sometimes things don't always go your way. So you need, to, you need to sort of analyze the situation and you need to sort of move past that as well. So it's a good sort of cornerstone for understanding, you know, how life works as well. And that all sounds great, but if you're wondering how you take a dozen or so kids from different neighborhoods with competing personalities and somehow get them all to buy into this new mindset to work together, well, it's a challenge. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's beyond a challenge. Um, dealing with teenage players, you know, some, and especially if they're good players and they're being recruited, everyone's telling them how good they are. But a coach's job is to take the player's focus away from that and onto the team. The cha- honestly, it starts at practice. You know, you have to, before you get on that road, you have to build that, co- uh, that chemistry. Unfortunately, even if you do build that chemistry, it's tough when you see the same coach you saw on television a month ago sitting courtside watching you play. So you kind of, your brain kind of stops working for a little bit. So we, we often, you know, especially with our younger groups, once we get on the road and they're playing in front of college coaches, it happens every single time. Guys make selfish plays, it's all about them, they have attitudes. And it's in these moments where RJ and Amir remind a player that if he's going to achieve his goals, he can't do it without the person next to him. And what we do is, you know, we, we tell them like, hey, if you want to get a scholarship, you're not going to get a scholarship unless He's with you because basketball is not an individual sport. And that's not always the easiest mindset to get kids to buy into, but once you have it, it makes all the difference. No, um, when you have that buy-in and everyone's together like a family, and to be honest, that's the type of atmosphere we try to create, a family atmosphere. So when we have that, we're, we're very successful. And if you're trying to set an example for kids to come together and form a family, you can't manufacture that. You can't fake it. You have to put yourself out there and be real with them and just be as, as genuine as possible. And I think kids, they feed off that. They really do. They, they don't, you could be the greatest coach in the world, you can be the greatest guy in the world, but if they don't relate to you, it doesn't matter. And they accomplish that the only way you can, by spending time with their players off the court, particularly when they travel for tournaments, which is a great opportunity to show kids a world beyond basketball. The truth is, and guys don't know this about New York City guys, I mean, New York City kids, if you're from Brooklyn, there's no world beyond Brooklyn. Yep. This is all you know. You're Sometimes from, not even your neighborhood, like a 10 block radius. Exactly, yeah. this is all you know. You're not leaving, you're not going past 10 blocks for the, you know, <laughs> until you're 18. Some of, a lot of these guys, they've never boarded a plane until they come to our, our program. They're like, like, you know, it's funny to see their faces and how nervous they are, but, but it's, it's cool. It's, it, it makes me feel good. I'm like, wow, like we're showing them. You're expanding their horizons. Exactly, right. it's, it's a big world out here. And, and this country has a lot to offer. Coach RJ and Coach Amir use basketball to try to give everything they can to these kids, to bind them together into something special, because they've experienced how basketball has done that for them. Basketball has helped me develop uh, friendships that'll last forever, really. Um, From this guy right here, uh, I coach with him, he's been my best friend, Um, but it all started with basketball. At the City Basketball, Coach RJ and Coach Amir do more than just teach their players. They use basketball to involve their kids in something bigger than themselves and form bonds that bring them together. They show them a little bit of the world and more importantly, they work to instill a mindset in them that prepares them for where they go out into the world on their own. That's what winning is to them, more than anything that happens on the court. 
Honestly, it's, it's not about winning. It's really about doing the right thing. It's about, about respecting the game, respecting each other, respecting ourselves, and really doing the right thing. It's about character. I think it really comes down to character and, and, and building character. And, and, and that's how we measure our success. You know, how many kids are, are responding to us and are and doing the right thing. It's a challenge, but that's how we measure success. I don't know if I answered your question. Right. You perfectly answered okay. my question. Yeah. Yeah. As a teacher, Jesus' goal was to do more than just teach his students. Instead, he brought 12 diverse members of a small community together to form a new family. In fact, Jesus even called them his friends, saying he would die for them. More than that, he prepared them to go out into the world. After all, he was a revolutionary who wanted to change the world, and he didn't try to do it on his own. We see this even in the 12 disciples he chose, a clear allusion to the 12 tribes of Israel. With these 12 disillusioned, reject followers, Jesus was creating a new kingdom. And this revolutionary rabbi empowered these 12 followers to do what he did, to advance his revolution, so that the whole world could experience the peace, hope, and love that bonded them all together. When you look at the prominent figures in Christianity, both past and present, it's impossible not to notice that they're predominantly male. The Gospels seemingly present a similar picture. Jesus accepted these 12 disciples, yes, but they're all Jewish males. What about women? What about anyone else that doesn't fit that mold? Is there a place for them at the feet of this rabbi? There is an interesting story that we find in the Gospel of Luke in which Jesus and his disciples visit the house of two women, Mary and Martha. The story goes like this. Martha welcomes Jesus into their house and begins to cook for him. Meanwhile, Mary sits at the feet of Jesus and listens to the rabbi's teachings. Martha becomes extremely upset at this and tells Jesus to make Mary get up and help her. After all, with the disciples there, she has over a dozen people to feed and no one to help her. But when we take a closer look at the first century world this took place in, we find that another aspect of this scene would have appalled Martha as well. Mary is sitting at the feet of this rabbi. You see, in that time and place, a common phrase used to indicate that you were a disciple of a certain rabbi was to say that you sat at their feet. In that world, women were second-class citizens. Most of them could not read, and history doesn't tell us of any women who were disciples of a rabbi in that time. So, looking at a culture in which higher learning was only for men, in which following a rabbi was only for men, we can understand Martha's shock at seeing her sister learning at the feet of this rabbi. My favorite part of that story is the last line. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. In a world in which various people and institutions, some of them religious, try to label us, limit us, tell us who's in and who's out, the words of this rabbi speak just as powerfully now as when he first said them. Anyone is free to choose to follow him, learn from him, be empowered by him, and no one can take that away from you. For centuries, people from all over the world have flocked to New York seeking a new way of life. A great many came through this place, Ellis Island. It's a museum now, but for roughly 60 years, this little island in New York Harbor was America's largest immigration site. In that span of time, over 12 million people came through here, fleeing wars, racism, poverty, religious persecution, to try and find a better life. The names of those who came through here serve as a reminder that this city, like this country, is meant to be a community of all communities. A place defined not by a particular culture or ethnic group, but by people of all kinds trying to find a new and better way in life. 
On approaching Ellis Island after a long journey, this statue, the Statue of Liberty, was the first glimpse of New York the newcomers would see. For those fleeing rejection, persecution, and oppression, this great woman, known as Mother of Exiles, was a symbol of a place that accepted those that the rest of the world didn't want. But that idea is a lot older than this statue or even this city. In fact, the words of the poem engraved on the Statue of Liberty have a strong resemblance to the words Jesus the Rabbi read when he first announced his revolution. After Jesus finished his reading at the synagogue, he went on to shatter his audience's notions of religious and social exclusivity, highlighting how God had showed favor and compassion on a Gentile woman and a Gentile man. These were people that that particular religious group cared nothing about. This was an essential part of this rabbi's teaching. God cares about outsiders. This so angered the religious group that he said it to that they tried to take him from the synagogue and throw him off a cliff. Jesus the rabbi placed a revolutionary emphasis on accepting people that those around him deemed unacceptable. After escaping that scene, Jesus spends the rest of the gospel narrative spreading this message. The gospels are filled with teachings of Jesus. They represent the majority of their content. He taught in synagogues, on the streets, in the temple, in people's homes, on mountains and in fields. He taught through sermons, through stories, through scripture readings. He taught men, women, children, rich, poor, Jews and Gentiles. He taught about God, the law, how to treat others, basically about his revolution, the kingdom of heaven. The diversity of the people Jesus taught and accepted was immense. And although his teachings were many, their message was simple. In fact, Jesus himself boiled them down for us. Love God and love the person next to you. Everything he taught and everything he did was about that. And love doesn't look at where you come from, what you've done or what you look like. It just looks at you. And maybe that's why so many people followed Jesus, because he looked at them and loved them. This rabbi didn't just teach those at his feet. He picked them up and he showed them the way. The Gospels present a fascinating picture of this rabbi. They say, here he is, look at his teachings, look at how he lived, Look at how radically he accepted and loved people. He invited the world to follow him, leaving those who encountered him with the question, is this a rabbi I'd like to follow? <laughs> 